Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. Tonight we're going to continue our Bible study on the book of First Samuel, and we're going to find ourselves in chapter 3. If you want to see the notes, click on the tab that says Notes in the lower left-hand corner, and a window will open, and you can follow along there. If you want to print them off, if you click in that area, then you can tell it to print, save as a PDF, and uh, print them off. So, let's get ready. Maybe you want your... A uh, cup of water, or maybe your, your Bible, your lesson, and uh, let's get ready. So the title of our lesson this evening is God Speaks to Samuel, and this is First Samuel chapter 3. If you have your Bible open, you will see that it probably has a heading that says something like this, The Lord Calls Samuel. Now, verse number one, it says, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. Now, this is the third time that this specific phrasing is used, that Samuel ministered to the Lord. Now, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Uh, there was only an occasional prophet that came along with, thus saith the Lord. The only word uh, we've read about so far in this book is the prophecy concerning Eli's imminent judgment. Now, this was because of the coldness of man's heart. It was not because God was distant or that God was far away or that God had changed, but Eli's heart had grown, grown cold. And this is a danger that all of us run in serving the Lord let us not grow cold, but let us stay attentive to the things of the Lord. Question number two, God's first words to Samuel are recorded in verses two to four. Now at this time, Eli, he was getting older. His eyes were getting dim. Now this was true spiritually as well as physically. The spiritual part is actually worse than the physical part. Now, it says here that the, before the lamp of the Lord went out, and before it could go out, God called Samuel. And again, uh, the uh, immediate physical application of this is the priests were to keep the lamp reservoir full of oil so it would burn all night. Uh, the priests were to keep the word before the congregation. So the lamp was a symbol of the word of the Lord and the priests, that's what they were supposed to do. And it was in this dark hour that God spoke to Samuel. There's a, there's a truth here that is true for all ages. In every dark hour, God will always send someone to speak and say, thus saith the Lord. Now, question number three, the implication here is that God spoke in an audible voice to Samuel. Now we notice here that in verse number one, it says the boy. Now we don't have an age here. We, it doesn't say when he was 12 or 13. It could very well be that he was about uh, that age. And uh, so Samuel responded, here I am. And uh, he ran to Eli. And he said to Eli, you know, you called me. What, what do you want? And Eli, you know, probably was half asleep. Have you ever, <laughs> you're just half asleep and uh, one of the kids comes running and, no, no, I didn't call you. Go, go back and go lie down. Go back to bed. And a little bit later, the Lord called Samuel again and, and he ran back to Eli and, you know, uh, you called me. Here I am. What do you want? And Eli sent him back to bed and a little while later, again it happened, and finally the light came on to Eli. He recognized that God was speaking to Samuel. Question number four, this time Eli told Samuel, If the Lord speaks again, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now, it is nice to know that God speaks to us again. OK, uh, we may not understand or hear his voice the first time or the second time, but he's patient with us. Uh, now, Samuel did not yet know 
the voice of the Lord. He didn't recognize that this was God speaking to him. He loved the Lord. He has been doing this work for quite a few years now, but he has not heard God speak. Eli gave wise counsel, even though he was getting careless. And he told him to say, speak, Lord, and identify that, Lord, I know that you're trying to speak to me. And question number five, sure enough, the Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Now, the reason that it's repeated, Samuel, Samuel, is, and anytime you see this in scripture, it means pay attention, and it's a term of endearment. And so here he spoke to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. This time Samuel answered, Hear, Lord, speak, for your servant hears. Now, here's God's message, these next little items. Uh, I will do what I said against Eli's house. Samuel was there. Samuel heard what the old prophet said when he came to tell Eli. He said, I will judge for what Eli knows. He says, I will judge because Eli did not restrain his sons. In, in that time, uh, parents were responsible for their sons and children even when they became older. And in that day, when a son uh, was uh, an evil person and did evil things, they were supposed to bring them before the congregation, and the congregation was to help them to restrain their children. None of that happened here. It shows a weakness in Eli's character. The Lord told Samuel that sacrifices would not atone for their sins. Now, that doesn't mean that the sacrifices would not work. It doesn't mean that when we make a sacrifice, when they made a sacrifice to the Lord, that it would not forgive their sins. But Eli's sons were past the point of repentance in that they would offer a sacrifice for their sin, but their heart was determined not to follow the Lord. So in that sense, the sacrifice doesn't, quote, work because God's not going to accept it, okay? It's like uh, telling someone, uh, uh, I'm going to steal from you, uh, I'm sorry, but then you steal from them again. You know, that, that just doesn't work. You're not really sorry. Now, question number six, in the morning, Samuel got up as usual and he began his work in the tabernacle, trimming the lamps, putting more oil in, uh, probably have to sweep some things up and, you know, get the uh, morning sacrifices ready. And Eli came to him and he wanted Samuel to tell him all the Lord said to him. And he was a little bit firm with Samuel. He said, no, don't hide it. Which, you know, on, on two parts. The first part is a child, right? You know, a, a child might be afraid of what they heard and they're, they're, not, they're not really willing to, you know, say, you know, the Lord has something hard to say to you and might, might not be willing to do that. He says, don't hide it. May God judge you too if you don't tell me all. It must have been difficult for Samuel to tell Eli that you're, you're, you're going to be judged. Your sons are going to be judged. So he told uh, Samuel everything that the Lord had said. Now, everything that the Lord told Samuel, Eli has heard this before from the old prophet who came just in the previous chapter. Now, that didn't, the previous chapter when Eli heard this, he didn't change his ways. And here, Eli hears it again. Now, Eli may have dismissed what the old prophet said to him as just an old, old man. However, when God is speaking to Samuel, this young child, it, this, is, this is really going to happen. And instead of Eli repenting and calling on the Lord for mercy and to rein his sons in, Eli simply says, oh, oh well, it's the Lord. Let him do what seems good. Uh, he, his character, the flaw, flaw of uh, just almost like could care less. 
Well, that was a sad response. He should have thrown himself on the mercy of God. He should have immediately disciplined his sons, but he didn't do that. Now, question number seven. Samuel grew physically and spiritually. We knew that he's been growing because every year his mothers have been bringing him a new robe, right? And the Lord was with him. Now, this was in sharp contrast to the Lord not being with Eli's sons. And the scripture says here that none of Samuel's words fell to the ground. In other words, everything that the little boy, everything the young lad, everything this young man was saying and what he was hearing from the Lord None of his words fell to the ground, or none of his words did not come true. So when Samuel said something, it means that everything he said, it happened. Now, he was known from border to border. The scripture says he was known from Dan to Beersheba. Dan was in the far north towards Syria, and Beersheba was down towards uh, the road going to Egypt. There was now new revelation from the Lord. And it says, number, question number eight, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Now, the people must have rejoiced with new leadership. No longer would hypocrisy come from the priesthood. You know, it's disheartening when we'll say that uh, the church says, we shouldn't do this. The word of the Lord says we shouldn't do this. True people of God say we shouldn't do this. But then the minister does it or the minister's family does it. Now, I know that you, the pastor can't uh, always control his children, especially when they get grown. Doesn't mean they're going to be perfect, but we do need to bring discipline. The word of the Lord is always the answer for unrighteousness. And so here it must have been a wonderful day. It must have been a a breath of fresh air for the people. Now we have a completely different, we, we leave that section and we come to the end in chapter five, we come to the end of Eli's house. Israel went to war with the Philistines. Now we don't know how much time passed from chapter four to chapter five. Uh, the Philistines were immigrants from the island of Crete. A long time before this. They were the first in this part of the world to use iron. So in this area of Canaan, they were the first. They had, they had Greek military equipment. They had uh, helmets of metal and shields, armor, swords, spears. So they were really well equipped to fight. And Israel suffered heavy losses against them. As you can imagine, if one army is equipped with military gear and the other, you know, they've, they've got sickles and hoes, uh, you know, it's, there's, no, there's no equity there. Now, that night, question number 10, that night the elders of Israel questioned why they lost the battle. Uh, now, they decided to bring the ark of the Lord onto the battlefield. In years past, God had ordered them to bring the ark into the fight at different times. Not every time, but every once in a while, the Lord would tell them, bring the ark, put the ark on the, on the shoulders of the priests. And sometimes the priests were to go first into the battle. Now that's scary, isn't it? You know, they have no armor, they have uh, no protection. And here are these 12 priests, they're carrying the ark on their shoulders and they're headed into battlefield first. Other times the uh, ark was put in the middle of the battlefield and other times it was in the, in the back. Uh, it was always at the order of the Lord. Now, when the Lord commanded that they bring the ark onto the battlefield, they defeated their enemies or really, I should say, is that the Lord defeated their enemies. Time and again, if you go back and read through Joshua and you read through Judges, sometimes just bringing the ark or the Lord being with them, it says the Lord discomforted the enemy. 
we don't know what that means. It, we know that the war, Lord went before them and defeated them. And so they didn't even have to fight sometimes. Now, they were thinking here, if it worked once, maybe it'll work again. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were with the ark. And so uh, they bring the ark from Shiloh onto the battlefield. Uh, question number 11. Israel had great confidence when the ark arrived. They shouted. They praised the Lord. Oh, the earth shook with the sound of of the praise and the, the, the shout of battle that went up as the ark came into the camp. Now, it had the opposite effect on the Philistines. It did what Israel hoped. It struck terror in the hearts of the Philistines. The Philistines learned when, when that shout happened, the scouts uh, told their leadership, the ark of the Lord had come into the camp of the Israelites. God has come into the camp. Now, remember when uh, the, uh, Joshua sent spies into Jericho. Remember what Rahab said? He said, we are afraid of your God. You have struck terror in our hearts. So when the Philistines heard that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp and that God had come into their camp, they were, they were terrified. And their leaders warned them, you better fight hard or you'll become servants of the Hebrews. And, and so they, they, were just, they were just terrified that they were going to lose the battle that day. Now in question number 12, the presence of the ark did not bring Israel the victory. That day, 30,000 soldiers of the Israelites fell in battle. The ark was captured by the Philistines. Oh, what a terrible day. Now, during the battle, Hophni and Phinehas died in that battle too, as the Lord said. Now, we don't know, we don't know how they died. As sons of the high priest, they would have been commissioned to look after the ark. They would not have taken up arms to be a regular soldier in the battle. Uh, they may have thought that just being near the ark God wouldn't let anything happen to them. Or maybe in defending the ark, uh, they did put up a fight, but they lost their lives uh, that day. Now, nothing was wrong with the ark. There was nothing wrong with God. Even good things can become idols. And see, that's what they did. They made the ark into an idol. Just because the ark of the Lord was with them, they thought nothing bad could happen to them. Israel thought they could ignore the God of the ark and find deliverance in the ark of God. It just doesn't work that way. Now, Eli was back at home, and when he learned of his son's death, uh, the Bible says he fell off a fence, and he broke his neck, and, and he died. Uh, at this time, when uh, the news came of what was happening in the battle, Phineas's wife, she was pregnant, and she went into labor at the news of her husband's death. And that sometimes, that does happen to women that hear tragic news, they will suddenly go into labor. Now, the midwife tried to cheer up uh, Phineas's wife, and she declared to Phineas's wife, it's a boy. There should have been such excitement and joy in the birth of a boy, or the birth of a son. And the scripture says she didn't respond. Instead, his wife, Phineas' wife, she named the child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed from Israel. Now, this was a sad day in the loss of the ark. It was a sad day in the loss of the high priest and sad day in the that even as terrible as uh, Hophni and Phineas had acted, it was still a sad day. Someone lost a husband, uh, and it was a it was a it was a sad day. And Phineas's wife, 
she recognized that something, something terrible had happened, this judgment. Uh, now, at the same time, the glory of the Lord had not departed forever. It, it had been departing for some time with her evil husband and his brother, Hophni. Uh, that had been going on for some time. And uh, so she thought that with the ark gone, all is lost. Well, not all is lost. Because in the midst of this dark hour, when the high priest of Eli and his sons was coming to a close, there was a bright new day that was rising. And that was in the boy Samuel. Amen. Well, that's our lesson for this evening. Thank you for being with us today. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are grateful today that even in the midst of dark, hard times, Lord, you always send a ray of sunshine. The cloud always has a silver lining if we just wait for it. So, Lord, today in the midst of dark times, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen and bring answers to prayer. We pray for sickness, Lord God, today that you would bring healing to those who are sick. We pray, Lord, you would bring the answers to those who are waiting on you. We pray, Lord, there are those that need resources. They, they have decisions to make. Lord, we pray that they would hear from you today. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over each one. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight. You have a wonderful week. We hope to see you soon. Take care.